Dice Equilibrium presents my interview with John Bermuda Schwartz. So, first question: How have you been? Uh, I've been pretty good. Uh, you know, I've been sitting for about the last eighteen months. Uh, the uh, the local gigs I play in several local bands here in Los Angeles, and uh, those gigs have started to come back a little bit, and uh, which is good. Uh, I enjoy playing, and uh, we. Uh, you know, uh, sadly, Al's tour that was planned for 2021 uh, got postponed and uh, we don't have exact dates. I mean, we would like to go out as soon as we can. So when that's possible, we will be back out there. OK, that's good to hear. Um, so um, I remember from the Black and White and Weird Al over interviews, uh, you said you were going to start digitizing your color photos. Have you started on that? And I started and finished. You finished. Uh, I, I, I t it took me uh, almost four and a half months. I, I scanned every day, every day I, out of, I don't know, however many days I took, I think three days where I didn't do any work at all. And the other days I did two, three, four, sometimes five rolls of film. Uh, there were more, more than 400 rolls of film. And uh, it's all done. It's all digitized and, and looks pretty good. Anything I need to return to for future projects, I can go into Photoshop and touch them up a little bit, make them real nice. But uh, the quality on them is great. Uh, you know, it's just, it's really nice to see those images for the first time, really as clear as possible from the negatives. I mean, seeing a, a small print, you know, from 35, 40 years ago uh, is nice, but it, it's not, it's not brilliant. Sometimes the color wasn't right. Sometimes the, the density and the texture. I mean, there, there, there are all sorts of issues you have when you at prints made in a one hour photo lab and and being able to go back to the original negatives really brings a lot of these photos to life and a lot of the clarity and also i saw a lot of stuff that i hadn't seen since i took them sometimes i would give away the photo that i shot to the person who was in it and i had i had no other physical record other than the negatives which i hadn't seen again until very recently so it was great to see a lot of stuff uh, that was fresh to me you know stuff i shot that i hadn't seen in in 20 30 40 years so that was that was very cool too. It was very revealing, you know. And I saw old pets and old cars and my old homes and old friends and old bands and places that the Al and the band have gone on the road and you know us in the studio and you know things I really hadn't seen in a long time. So it was it was uh, neat. It was a nice trip down memory lane, as well as possibly leading to another book. Ooh, do you have any ideas what theme that book will be? Well, I, I don't know. It's going to be all color. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, I've already exhausted all of the black and white shots. Now, it, it'll be, uh, I don't know if it'll be a theme as much as just, you know, it's the rest of my film uh, shooting of, of Al and, and, you know, what we did for, you know, the 25 years that I shot film on him from 1981 to like 2006. Uh, so that's where it would, if, if we, if, if there's another book and if we present everything, it's going to be a 25 year span. That doesn't mean that's, all the photos I ever shot. That means that's just all the color film that exists that I shot uh, after that. And actually during some of that time during, you know, starting in actually starting in mid 1997, I started shooting digital. So there's an overlap and the more digital I began to shoot, the less film I shot. So uh, there are some years where I, I didn't have any film at all on out, which is really interesting because I really thought I carried a film camera around a lot more than I did at the end. And I didn't. Uh, I, I, I eased into digital. And once I was shooting digital pretty regularly, it was really rare that I shot film. The last film I shot on him was 2006. And I also shot digital that day. And it's interesting to see, uh, you know, the, the comparison between the digital, digital shots of, of that era and the film shots, because the film looks great. And the digital looks pretty good. I mean, it looks pretty good, say, to see on, on a computer screen but I don't know that any of that would be publishable. So it's nice that I have film, at least up until that point. Then there was a point where digital got really good and even in consumer cameras and that stuff really started to rival film. And at that point, it was like, I hadn't shot film again, you know, I hadn't shot film since maybe 2007 was the last film I shot on anything. Okay. But all digitized now, all ready to do whatever I need to do with it. That's, that's perfect. You can probably have like multiple books with that content you have. Well, I, you know, there, there are, there were 4,500 shots, film shots in color of Al and the band, you know, doing stuff. 
And I don't know that all of them are really worth seeing. And I, and I don't know that it would you know, require more than one really, really action packed, jam packed book. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to just keep putting out books of, you know, here's us in 1984, you know, kind of thing. That's, that's really sort of, I think the fans would get tired of that. I think they want a lot of stuff at once. And there's even some overlap on the black and white book. And I tried to make sure that I didn't have exactly the same color shot that I had a black and white counterpart, because you've already sort of seen that. But I had color shots where I didn't have black and white counterparts, you know, of course, vice versa. And, and uh, there's some really nice shots from the Eat It video, let's say, uh, you know, from, and then other things where I didn't shoot black and white at all, of course, you know, headline news video, like a surgeon, bedrock anthem, stuff like that. So that. I think it's going to be a lot of stuff in the book. It's going to be us in the studio, us on the road, uh, you know, on, on video shoots. There's like just miscellaneous stuff, him over at my house, you know, us recording stuff, uh, you know, sitting in a restaurant somewhere, you know, on the road, you know, in front of Niagara Falls, just, you know, a, a bunch of different things. So haven't quite figured out, you know, how to organize that. If it's going to happen, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how to put it all together. You know, that'll be the editor's job at the publishing company to decide how it all fits. You know, that's not something I can do because I would just sort of put it out there in chronological order and it would just be a mishmash of stuff. It would really just jump around and wouldn't make, other than being in, in order by time, wouldn't make any real sense. It would just be like, we did this this week and then next month we did this and here's a couple of days of us doing this. And then six months passed and I didn't shoot any film on Al. And then we, we went out and ate and I took a picture, you know, just stuff like that. It would just be really incongruous. So we're, we're hoping, uh, you know, if, if these things can be grouped nicely, you know, and not all of 45 are, are really going to get printed. I mean, I, I would be surprised if, if more than 250 or 300 get out there, but they would be really, really great shots, really dynamic shots and in quality that nobody's ever seen before. Cause this is like, this is from the negatives as, as were the black and white shots. And a lot of those hadn't been seen at all by anyone. Uh, and, and most of these have not been seen, but the ones that have, they, they will look stellar. So I hope it happens. And, and I'm really looking forward if it does. I'm looking forward to it too. That sounds really exciting. So a follow-up question on the idea of publishing photos in books. Why did you choose to publish them in a book rather than just online like you've done on the website before? Well, this was, I mean, the book is, it's my book. So, uh, you know, this, this was a question of being able to put out quality that you can't really see on a computer screen. I mean, you would, it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't look the same. You can't really, I guess you could put your computer on the coffee table and then it's a coffee table book, <laughs> uh, a coffee table, Kindle book, I suppose. Uh, no, it was just, I, I thought it would be cool to, to put them out there in a quality, you know, one, it was the quality and two, uh, you know, they hadn't been seen. And I thought this would just be like a really cool physical memento, you know? Yeah. There's a ton of pictures on his website. I mean, I, I put most of them there, you know, over the 20 plus years I did his site and and the quality varied wildly. And it did because in the early days, computer screens were, were fairly small. The resolution was very small. So if you put uh, you know, a, a 320 by 240 pixel image on there, that was like 25% of the screen. That was pretty large. You know? uh, the other problem was you know, nowadays, that's just, that's tiny. I mean, it's, it's almost not visible. The other thing was when I put those pictures up, uh, you know, I started doing his site in 1995. And when I started putting pictures up, uh, the, uh, the, the, the speed, everyone was pretty much on dial up and there was a speed issue. So you couldn't put any, any images on there that were too big, you know, that took too long to download. And then there was also a question of, of the web space. You didn't get that much space. I mean, I think the very first space I had for Al was like a hundred K, which is just silly. I mean, pictures now are, are a hundred, 200, 300 K without even blinking. This was for an entire site. So I had sort of a rule of thumb was one, the images had to be as small as possible and still be visible. And they also had to be size wise. I mean, I, the, the, the file size had to be small. It had to be like 15 to 20 K, which is nothing now, maybe 25 max. If it was really, if I had to put like a really big image for some reason, it might be 25 K. That was really a large file for me. And I did that, you know, for, for a lot of reasons. Well, I think several of those photos still exist on weirdal.com and, and in other places that I posted them eventually. And, and they're just, they're tiny. Well, some of those photos would be now in a book visible in a way that, that they never looked. Even if I was to 
go ahead and post the scans that I had, you know, scan of the negatives now and, and call that, you know, the, the quality from the original. It still wouldn't look as good as seeing it in a book, as seeing it in print. And also the cool thing about a book is that's something that uh, Al and I or the guys can sign. You know, if someone brings those to a show, you know, when we start doing shows again and can catch up with us, oh, we're happy to sign those. You know, and that's not something easily done on a pad or a phone or a laptop. So it's a physical memento. And, and that, was, that was part of the reason. And, and, and the second book would follow that as well. You know, um, it would just be a, a cool physical thing to have. I mean, especially in an age where, you know, a lot of music is not physical anymore. I mean, you're, you're not holding a, a, a booklet and holding a CD and, you know, have an actual product that you have on the shelf that you, you know, a lot of the fans display all that stuff together. And uh, or like, you know, like I have a lot of CDs, for example. And and it's just it's nice, you know, in a world where everything has gone kind of virtual to have a nice physical product. One thing I wanted to ask that's kind of specific I've been listening to the Dave and Ethan 2000 inch podcast. And you said once that you had full tapes of concerts. How, yeah. how many tapes do you have of these concerts and how far does this collection collection go back? Uh, I, I recorded us playing all the way back to 19, well, 1981, uh, you know, it would, before really the country knew about Al. You know, before the world knew about him. So I always recorded stuff just like I always took pictures of things, just like I always saved artifacts, you know, from my involvement, not just with him, but with any band I've, I've been in. That was just something I do. Uh, I mean, I have live recordings of, of most of the bands I've been in. Uh, I have hundreds uh, of Al. I mean, hundreds and hundreds, uh, which is by no means all of our shows. I mean, we've done 16, 1700 shows maybe over the, well, since I've been with him. Uh, and, and uh, you know, mo unfortunately, most of the recordings, I mean, they're, they're nice for curiosity's sake and just to sort of hear some fun stuff. You know, they're not high quality recordings by any means. They're recorded re with a cassette recorder uh, out front where the board is. So there's a lot of audience noise. There's a lot of ambience in, in the venue. Uh, you know, the, the quality, the, the mix is only as good as the mix was for that show. And back in the early days, we had different people, whoever was, was running that club or small theater or whatever they did our mix so we had a different mix every night you know i mean it, there was a point where we began to bring out our own people and our own equipment and we saved the same mixes the same balances for the audience night after night you know they would adjust a little bit to the room to the acoustics of the room but all of our uh, eq and all, all of our balances and all of that stuff were already saved and it was the same person doing the show and we had some consistency there so the recordings i made of shows say starting in the 90s were, were much more consistent. Again, the quality, it's not something we would put out. Uh, later, we began to have digital recordings. I mean, multi-tracks of our performances. And uh, both Al and I have copies of all of those. I mean, could we conceivably put out a really good sounding live you know, concert? Uh, yeah, we could. Um, you know, I mean, there've been two on video already. And that sort of... Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's one thing to put out just audio and it's another thing to have a video. So that's why the, the uh, Weird Al Live from 1999 and then the Apocalypse Tour, the, the, uh, I forgot what the name of it was, but uh, whatever, whatever that tour was that that came out, uh, those are, uh, I mean, those are much better because you can see them as well. So just hearing a live recording is sort of, kind of only takes you halfway there. So there's not a real incentive to put those things out. You know, if, if Al wanted to, he could certainly source the same archives I have or, or ask me to go find something from 1985, you know, find us performing surgeon, you know, like a surgeon alive, you know, and he wants to post that, you know, I could very easily supply that all of that has been digitized as well. So I could supply that and, and likely even have some uh, pictures from that show. You know, a lot of the fans will take pictures and then send me the photos. So, you know, it's possible I could put together a photo of that performance of that recording of, of something from uh, 35 years ago. That's pretty cool. And that's really good to hear that the material is still out there. It's not just lost. No, no, no. It's, it's there and it's digitized and it is backed up five different ways and uh, nothing, nothing can happen to it. Nothing good. bad can happen. Tyler had some questions of his own. Do you want to go ahead, Tyler? 
I do. Um, so I know you did a lot with like percussion in uh, Philharmonic orchestras. So I wanted to ask uh, what, how playing percussion for Philharmonic uh, differs from playing uh, with a rock group like Weird Al. Well, they're, they're different kinds of parts. They're written out parts. Uh, they're, they're not always full drum set parts. Uh, it's rarely is it really pop music. So it's different. It's a whole different approach. Uh, you know, plus I get to play things that I don't normally get to play with Al, or at least not on a regular basis. I mean, in, in, uh, there was one particular orchestra I spent a lot of time with, uh, and it was the California Junior Philharmonic Orchestra, which is, was a well-known group that was conducted by the same guy from 1937 until he passed in sometime in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, that had been his orchestra for all those years. And I played timpani in there, and I played, uh, I would play cymbals, I would play bass drum, I would play you know, there's a certain other hand percussion, uh, tambourines, castanets, things like that, uh, snare drum, uh, whatever, you know, there were, there were three, four, sometimes five people in the drum section that would play all of those things. Now, I probably have played all of those things at one time or another with Al, but not in a live situation. I mean, I don't bring timpani on stage. I don't clash cymbals on stage, for example, you know, and things like that. So it's a, it's a different thing just as playing with other bands I play with. I mean, I just play different kinds of music. And, and that's, uh, that's just the gig at hand. And that's, that's fine. Like when I, when I was in marching band, I mean, that was a whole other approach as well. You know, in addition to having to march, in addition to having to, to, in my case, memorize parts, I didn't have a horn in front of me where I could put a little piece of music like most of the other players did. You know, we had, our drums were down here and we didn't really have music and we just sort of knew the parts and we had to march and we had to watch if we were in line and we had to watch how far we were for the next person. And we had to watch, the drum major up front who would cue us when to stop, who would cue us if there was a turn coming up because the drum section was usually in the back. And we, we didn't really know what was happening in front of us, you know, unless we kind of looked around the line of people to, to see if people up front were turning or whatever. So every, every gig I do is a little bit different. And, and, you know, they, they, uh, I mean, it all involves drums, but that's kind of where the similarity ends, you know, and they're all fun. I mean, they're all fun. If I didn't, if I wasn't having fun, I wouldn't do them. Yeah, so it's all, all been fun. I don't think, I don't think I've ever left a band. I've, I've never joined a band with the idea that it wasn't going to be fun. And I don't think I ever had to leave a band because it stopped being fun. I mean, there were other reasons that I either left or they broke up. And in some cases, neither happened. I mean, I've been playing with one guy, you know, not Al, but I've been playing with one guy since 1981. And uh, just did a gig with him the other night, you know, sort of our comeback gig after last year. And, and uh, it all just sort of, it all came back. There was no rehearsal. There was no, you know, I didn't really listen to any of the songs that I had played with him or recorded with him over all the years. It all just, you know, as soon as we were back in the same room, you know, it all just came back together. You know, it never really goes away. It's kind of, it's in our DNA, as, as they like to say. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's neat to do all these kinds of different things. And the orchestra was, was a lot of fun. I mean, I haven't played with them since, it's been seven, eight years. And I, I think that was the last, I think they split up after the original, after the founder conductor had passed away, his nephew had taken over as the conductor for a few years. And then the orchestra just kind of, it just sort of petered out and, and doesn't, uh, hasn't existed. If it still existed, I would still go play with them. Uh, you know, there were a lot of, uh, former members, a lot of, uh, alumni players that would come in there and, and, uh, flesh out the orchestra and a couple of them had become pros, you know, we're, we're in the union and, and, you know, they got a special uh, uh, allowance, uh, uh, permission from the union to do these shows, which were not paid shows, you know, so the, the union said, you know, yes, yes, Bermuda, you know, it's, it, this is a, a worthy cause or whatever, or this was established before the union was, and you're welcome to go do that and, and you know, and not get paid for it. And we're, we're cool with that, you know, which meant they didn't get their, percentage of what the musicians make so that was a big deal for them to waive somebody's fee because that was like taking money away from them you know little little bit uh but but it's all it's all fun you know and i'm not a melodic a melodic percussion player in other words i didn't play the bells or anything like that uh and timpani do get tuned to notes but i was certainly capable of doing that and and uh, that was fine and most of the time we we had very capable really good timpani players people who had really studied and, and knew a lot of technique and, and knew some tuning tricks and really knew how to work the drums. And I just sort of, I could get them tuned and I could, I could hit them. And that was kind of the extent. I don't really have a lot of technique for it, but depending what was going on, 
you know, I might play timpani. You know, there were some years we just didn't have, there were some years I was the best player in that section and whatever the most important part was, I would do that. Awesome. Um, so I also wanted to ask what like the writing process is like uh, in the studio, specifically when it comes to like originals, do you all kind of just come to a mutual agreement on how the song should sound and work together? Or is it more along the lines of having specific lines written out and just playing as written? Uh, so how does that work? Uh, Al, Al writes all of those himself. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and he tells us either what we're playing or, or roughly what to play, or, you know, I want it to sound like this. Or if he's absolutely not sure, he'll say, okay, and you'll, you know, to Jim, for example, for a solo, it says, and you'll, you'll know what kind of, you know, the vibe of the song, you'll know what to do for a solo. I, I, didn't, I didn't write out a solo. It's okay. But he pretty much has written the parts. I mean, drums, bass, guitar, keys, horn parts, if there are horns. And, and he's in charge of that 100%. Now, that's not to say that we don't have some input and that he doesn't ask us to take, you know, give some input. You know, sometimes, you know, again, you know, not being a drummer, not being a bass player, he doesn't always, he may not come up with a, a sensible, you know, part that a, a drummer or a bass player would play, you know, and, and so Steve or I might say, you know, that's not really, the bass wouldn't do that here, the drums wouldn't do that kind of thing, I know you sort of hear it rhythmically, but it's just, that's not, a drummer wouldn't do that, you know, if you, and I'll show you, and we'll rehearse it as a band with him and show him why maybe it doesn't work, you know, or, or why it does, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, the, our, our first thought on all of the things, you know, he'll, he'll create it, he'll record his own demo of something and send it to us. And our first, you know, inclination is to play what he has given us to play, you know, and we'll do that as a band, we get together and, and we will then record a band demo of, of the song. And, you know, and we'll massage it further from there. By the time we get to the studio, though, we already know what we're going to do. By the time we record the band demo, and, and Al's had a chance to listen to that, we've had a chance to listen. He may give a couple of other little hints, or he may say, you know what, just do, do what you did on the demo, and, and that's it. So we don't run through it again in the studio. We go in and we literally just start recording. There's not really, you know, way back in the 60s and 70s, you know, maybe the 80s bands would go into the studio and they would work in the studio. They would write and rehearse and they, you know, they just sort of lived in the studio. You know, they would take weeks or months to record an album. You know, we'll, we'll take a, a total of maybe two weeks, three weeks tops split up in a couple of sections to do an entire album because we've already done a lot of that work up front. So we have some input, but really it's, it's Al as the guy, uh, you know, who, who knows what he wants and, and uh, you know, knows when he gets it. And if he's not quite sure, he will then ask us and then we're happy to, to do what we do. So we have some input. Uh, it doesn't amount to writing credit, however. It's just, you know, well, I'll do this kind of a drum fill here, or I'll do this, you know, I'll hit this bass note here, but it's not, a, it's not really a, a melodic thing. It's not part of the melody. And, and uh, you know, sometimes he'll run lyrics by us, you know, just to see, you know, does, is this funny? You know, or if I say, you know, this, do, you know, do you know what that means? Do you know what that word is? You know, the kids are all saying it, but as an adult, do you know what, you know, th th this means? And, and if we do, you know, he'll go with it. He'll go, okay, it's not going over too many people's heads. Because we, we have a lot of adult fans. You know, we're not just appealing to, to kids at all given times. You know, it's not just kids. You know, when I say kids, I mean teenagers. But we have five, six-year-olds in the audience. You know, we've got 60 and 70-year-olds in the audience. So it's got to be humor that, that everyone knows. And, and uh, you know, there's probably a lot of early stuff that today's kids you know, idioms, sayings, phrases that, that they maybe don't quite understand, you know, why it's funny or a lot of references, you know, old pop culture references that the kids, you know, eight, 10 year olds just don't know. The text in the right? mail. <laughs> well, yeah, for example, you know, uh, now they can, uh, they can Google it. I mean, they can Google anything, you know, and, and, uh, you know, what does that mean? You know, what does this title mean? Why is it, why does he keep repeating it in the chorus? You know, why is that so funny? You know, and, and, and some of the other lines in the checks in the mail, you know, we'll do lunch and stuff like, you know, all of this, all of this kind of showbiz, you know, talk, you know, purported talk from the sixties and seventies, all these hipster showbiz guys, but you know, kids today don't, that they, they have to look it up or they got to ask, you know, an older relative, you know, or a parent, you know, what, what does that phrase mean? He keeps saying it over and over. Why is that? Why is it funny? You know? So there, anyway. All right. And, Last question we have, 
Um, so before when Al was putting out albums, every tour was themed after the album. So like the Super Tour, the Mandatory Tour. Then after you had the Vanity Tour with all originals and then the Strings Attached Tour with strings. So what's next? Right. I don't know. You don't we'll know? Have to see. <laughs> we, have to, we have to book a tour first. Okay. Uh, you know, we'll, if, if 20, I mean, we're not doing anything this year. I mean, that's for sure. Uh, if, if we can get out and, and safely play, uh, you know, and safely travel, uh, you know, next year we'll do it. I don't know at what point that can be announced. I mean, we obviously need to book stuff in advance and announce it in, in advance. Uh, so if, if everything was perfectly safe right now, you know, and we could go out in September, we couldn't. There'd be no way to promote the tour. There'd be no way to line up all of the people that we need to bring out for the crew. I mean, you can't do stuff like that on short notice. So we need to have a certain amount of notice that things are okay before we can even begin to think about going out. So let's say if there was to be a summer tour next year, we would need to, we'd need to start planning that like by the end of this year. I mean, we need to know this stuff like six months in advance and, and we don't know yet. So I, you know, I, I don't know, you know, when it will happen. I mean, sh should be another tour. And I don't know what the theme will be. Uh, you know, we'll see. You know, it's, it's extremely unlikely there would be an album out, you know, because there's been no work at all, uh, you know, to, to give that tour a theme, you know, and to play, you know, any new stuff. So I don't know. I, I have no idea what the, what the theme will be. Okay. I'll just assure you that we'll be okay if it's just like two hours of germs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all 13 Pokemon at least we're fine with anything <laughs> well that would that would be an interesting I mean that would be odd to do like a series of polka medleys or food medleys or something like that that we would do live with all of the stuff that we've done you know over the past almost 40 years of touring uh you know there would be a lot of stuff that the you know the hardcore fans will know that they'll know the polka from the you know in 3d and, and you know on up but there's a lot of stuff in there you know where those those songs are just ancient history I mean, sometimes the things, sometimes Al's choices were maybe a little obscure. I mean, they weren't all big hits thrown into a polka medley. You know, I mean, they were our original polka medleys when we used to play them live before there were albums and stuff like that. You know, we were doing polka medleys way back and they would be based on alternative and new wave hits that were that were hits on local radio station here called K-Rock. And, and they, uh, uh, you know, that, that would be known to the local audiences that we played to, uh, you know, because one K rock played Al's music, you know, at the time, those were just demos, but they played his, he was on for interviews. I mean, they liked him, you know, that was a nice kind of breath of fresh air from a lot of the serious new wave and, and, you know, the alternative that was starting to creep in. And, and so, uh, you know, that audience already knew our stuff here in LA, uh, you know, on a national level or a worldwide level. I don't know that they would really know those things other than, you know, having heard them on the albums, but they, you know, a lot of our fans weren't even alive when those albums came out. So we're playing, we're really relying on, on, on them being major fans of the old work to see us do that stuff in concert and, and appreciate it. You know. But Al is aware of that as well, you know, and doesn't drag out too much of the old stuff. I mean, we did that on the Vanity Tour. We dragged out a ton of old originals and dating way back, you know, from, from before, you know, our, our, our audience existed. And, but again, you know, the, the hardcores that would come to see a show of Al without costumes, without video, just sitting on stage for 90 minutes and, and playing originals, you know, are probably familiar with them, you know, and, and hopefully like them. And we gauged that as well. You know, we had a different show every night. So we, within about a week or maybe 10 days, I think, or maybe two weeks, we had run of the 50 originals we were, uh, that, that were on the list to choose from. I think we had run all of them by you know, we had played all of them at least once and had a chance to gauge the audience's reaction. And if they reacted really well, now Al had all the set lists written out before the tour, well before the tour, you know, even the very last show, we knew what we were going to play, you know, a month before we left. And, and, uh, but he, he might adjust that. He might change things around a little bit. If a song wasn't really, really popular, it wasn't getting a good reaction. We might play it a little bit less. I don't think we got, we didn't get rid of anything. Nothing got such a bad reaction that we just dropped it. If it got a really bad reaction, we would space it out a little more. Some songs got played once every couple of weeks. Some songs got played three or four times a week. 
I, there might have been some that got played five. I'm not sure. But it was all well orchestrated by Al as to, to frequency and what shows, what songs got played at what shows and, and that no set lists were exactly alike. You know, not to mention that we were also at every show, we also played a regular cover song, just a straight cover, uh, 77 of them that we learned to play 77 songs to play one time each ever. And then that was it. We played it and then we did, we never returned to it. So that was, and that was actually, that was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. We got to play some really fun stuff. And I think the audience is like that too. Uh, you know, and they never knew, even once they figured out, say the 50 songs after a couple of months, it's like, well, you're going to hear, you know, probably 15 out of these 50 songs at this show, but they never knew what the cover song was going to be that night. They never knew what they were going to hear. So if nothing else, every show was unique for that reason. But again, the set lists were all different too. Yeah, that was real. Like I just finished listening to all the Vanity Tours shows and every day it was a different set list and it was never boring. Oh, well, thanks. Well, that was the idea. I mean, it was all, it was supposed to be fresh and exciting because we have a lot of fans, you know, if we, if we play several shows within a few hundred miles of each other, they will come to those shows. Or if we've done a show somewhere and then we go travel around somewhere and then we come back and we're near that area again, or maybe even play the same uh, city again, because it sold really well in the first place. And they had an opportunity to book another show later when we were nearby, they would come to that show as well, knowing that they were going to see a different show, you know, and that's, that's not to say that it's a bad thing that when fans come to repeat shows during a normal tour where it's the same show every night, that's because they enjoy the show. It's like, it's like uh, watching reruns of a TV show that you really like, and you've seen the rerun. I mean, you don't expect it to be different. You know, it's like listening to an album over and over or going to see a movie, you know, over and over. It's not, you know, you don't expect to see something different every night. It's because you really like it, you know, and it's, it's cool if it's different, but not when you really like what you like. So if people liked a strings attached show, and we had two versions of that show. There was one song that was traded out. I think You Don't Love Me Anymore was traded out with one more minute as kind of the slow love ballady kind of a song. But apart from that, it was one or the other every night. And the rest of the set was the same. You had a pretty good chance. You know, if you came one night and then, and we were very careful if we came back in the same area, we would play the, the opposite show from what we had played. So if the people in that area had seen us play, you don't love me anymore. If we played there again, we would make sure we played the one more minute show, which was, I forget which, there was like set one and set two. And actually I have and my set list oh. from, from uh, set list number one had, uh, wow, uh, it had, uh, oh, had one more minute. Set list number two instead had You Don't Love Me Anymore. And they were actually in different places in the show. Uh, but that's, uh, you know. That was, that was sort of fun, but let's say the mandatory fun tour. It was absolutely the same show every night and people came to see it uh, repeatedly because they just, they liked the show that much. And it was really, you know, I, I got a chance to see what we do really for the first time. And I've got a lot of old videotapes of our shows, but they're not really nicely produced. You know, it's a, it was a VHS camera stuck out, uh, you know, by the, by the front board and with whatever lighting was and whatever the bad sound was and all of that. And that was kind of my, you know, I have like a stage shot of what we did. You know, we we're like really small and all that. That was my first impression of kind of what we looked like, you know, on stage. But when in 1999, when the Weird Al Live DVD and VHS came out and it was a nicely produced show with different angles, it was nicely mixed and all that. And you got to see the audience. And you got to really see what the lights did. That was my first impression after 20 years of really what we looked like on stage, you know, and how we how we kind of sounded to the audience. That was the first really good, proper recording video and audio that I knew, you know, that what we were doing was really cool and why people came to see it again and again. You know, it's not, it's not just that they're fanatics, which is where you get the word fan, but it's, they really enjoyed the show. And, and that was, that was very, very cool to know. And I saw that again with the, uh, uh, the apocalypse tour, uh, was, El yeah, apocalypse. And I can't, I can't think of the name of that there was a name for that video and I can't think what it is, but you know, that was again, a reminder that, you know, 15 years later, whatever it was, you know, almost 20 years later that we still had a really good looking show and, and why people came 
to see us again and again, you know, when they knew it was going to be the same show. So that was really cool. Uh, that's, I mean, they, the, the, the fans come out to see us either way. And that's just, you know, that's, that's testament to one, how good Al is and, you know, uh, how enjoyable and how enduring and long lasting his material is, you know, and the fact that we can all still play and entertain people as a group and that they still like it. I mean, we haven't had any bad reviews. I mean, maybe ever. It's just, it's been, it's been a really good ride, you know, and, and, uh, and I know why the fans come to repeat shows and it's cool. But with that vanity tour, it was especially enticing for them because they knew that there was a really good chance that if they came two nights in a row, let's say that they would hear a lot of different songs the next night. And they did, you know, in addition to whatever cover song we were going to do, you know, we might be doing a Beatles or a stone song one night. We do Leonard Skinner the next night. We do Buddy Holly one night, Alice Cooper, uh, Deep Purple. I think, I think Smoke on the Water was the very first cover song we did. We were in Poughkeepsie. And I think that was the first show and the first song. Uh, we did Kinks songs. Uh, we just, you know, we really, we had a lot of fun with it. We did some Clash. Uh, it was just, it was very cool. It was a lot of fun. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're still having fun after all this time. And I think that fans coming back is also a testament to how good you and the band are as well. Well, thanks. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, as, as a show, as a performance, I, it looks and sounds really good. And, and, you know, that's important to Al. I mean, he maintains a certain level of quality and production uh, to make sure it stays that way. You know, that was a, a, a chance we took, you know, literally like most bands do, just all sitting on stage, no costumes, no video, no nothing. And just playing, just playing music and just sitting there the whole time. And that was for us. I mean, we've never done that. That's never, ever been the show. I mean, maybe, maybe in 1983, 84, there was a lot of that, but there was a lot more going on as well. And we did actually incorporate film and eventually real video, but it was always a bit of a multimedia show and it just grew into more of a production. But, but, uh, we never, ever just sat up there and played like a lot of bands do. And I mean, Al doesn't really dance around much, you know, during that show. I mean, he gets up and moves around, but he's like sitting on a chair. We're all sitting on chairs. I mean, it's all just very relaxed. They put out a big giant rug for Al and the guys to sit on. on I mean, that's our, that's our set decoration is this big rug. So anyway, that's uh, that was taking a chance and it worked. It worked very well. I mean, it's conceivable we would do that again at some point, you know, but, but I, I don't know. I don't know if there would, you know, how many other different songs there would be. I mean, we only have so many originals. So there's only so many things we could pull out of the hat anyway. But I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I just know that we can go out and tour again and do a show that people will come to without having to have a new album. And that's, you know, again, that's the, the, the fans are great. They've hung in there with us and they love what we do. And we love what we do. And, it's, and that's why we all get to do it. That's why we get to keep doing it. It just gets better and better. Uh, with every tour.